In the 1930s, beginning around 1935, Franklin Roosevelt's staff began to beg him to put national health insurance into law. They had the Social Security package going through Congress, and Roosevelt decided health care would destroy the entire Social Security bill. So he said no, took it out, but for the rest of his administration, his staff is, please, 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 let's make national health insurance part of Social Security. Social Security was becoming very popular. Roosevelt is becoming a, a huge, a colossus in American politics. And in 1943, right in the middle of World War II, he decides, I'm going to do it. World War II, the tide has turned. He's going to win the war. He's going to come home at the end of the war, bring the troops back, and he's decided, I need another crusade, and that's going to be national health insurance. He takes his most trusted advisor, and he says, Sam, Sam Rosenman, Sam, write me a bill, and more important, write me a way to win this thing through Congress. Crowd goes off, writes a national health insurance package. There's one great memo in the archives in which someone says, health care is the most boring subject I have ever encountered. So we found that memo, had like a good laugh about it. It comes back, this whole package, and just as it arrives on his desk, Roosevelt dies suddenly in, um, in April of, 19, of 1945. This new guy, no one knows anything about him, Harry Truman, takes over, and here comes this package, really from Roosevelt's grave, national health insurance. Truman grabs it, and he makes it the cause of his life. Uh, no one knew whether he was going to even like it, but it becomes his crusade. Truman fails to win national health insurance, but this idea... National health insurance passes from every president to president. No president, liberal, moderate, or conservative, ever has been, been able to duck the uh, national health insurance issue. Every time a ferocious debate, this is socialism, this is terrible, this will destroy America, on the one hand, this is something that all citizens deserve, on the other. Knowing this history really puts the Obama administration's success in an extraordinary light. Everybody tried it. Everybody failed. To some extent or another, there have been some successes, mainly from Republicans. There have been some successes, but this was really an extraordinary achievement. And our book kind of gives the story of each president and how they tried to win national health insurance. We had a hypothesis, as we say in the social sciences. We had a hypothesis. Healthcare is the one area that all presidents know. They tend to be a very sickly bunch. President by president, you'd be surprised how many health care problems they had. John F. Kennedy got the last rites of the Catholic Church four times as an adult. His father, there's one scene, his father weeping by his hospital bed as the priest performs the last rites of the church. This is just a few years before he runs for president. So our hypothesis, these are men who understand health and illness. By the way, they're so sickly because secrecy is more important than good health care. So they, they, they don't get very good health care. At least that's been true in the past. Uh, and so we thought, these guys know health care. Of course, they're going to be sensitive to health care issues. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Never was a hypothesis more thoroughly refuted. They're tough guys. So Kennedy may be sickly, but he wants to give the impression of health, and their health care doesn't matter to them at all. What does matter? It's interesting the health of the people they love. Every president, while in office, confronts the illness of, well, take Kennedy's case, his father has a stroke. Healthcare goes from being something, ah, I could take it or leave it, to something he is obsessed with. He won't, he won't stop talking about it. So that it goes on his daily briefing, it goes from about number 37 right up to number four or five. And in talk after talk, um, in, in, in speech after speech, he describes his father's health problems and says, I don't know how, he's a wealthy man. I couldn't afford all the care he's getting, and I don't know how an ordinary person could. And all of a sudden, Medicare, the program to pay for health care for people over 65, which is being debated at that moment, becomes from a sort of sideshow in the Kennedy administration to Kennedy's obsession. This has been true president after president. Someone they love gets sick in Eisenhower, conservative old Mr. Eisenhower. Mamie, his wife's mother, has, uh, has a health episode, a serious health episode. All of a sudden, 
Ike is Mr. Healthcare. He decides to have a year of health care. This is a guy who didn't even think he should submit a budget to Congress because Congress should be the, the budget authority. Now all of a sudden he has a year of health care. He discovers health care in part because his mother-in-law gets sick. So that's one thing driving these presidents. But there's another thing. Health care is problematic. It's people get sick and the problems of health care, costs, access to health insurance, America's health in general, this is a problem that presidents can't avoid. So they're driven by personal reasons because people they love get sick and they're driven just because it's a problem that won't, won't go away. It's an issue boring, complicated, convoluted, but at the end of the day, presidents can't avoid it. The way we did this book, we went to every presidential archive and we studied what all the memos that were written and so forth, and we discovered lots of unexpected things. But our favorite story is the Lyndon B. Johnson story. So when we went to those archives, there were tapes Remember the tapes that got Nixon into so much trouble? Well, Johnson had those same tapes going, but they kept them hidden. They, they didn't re release them to the public till two or three years ago. And our book was one of the first ones that had access to these tapes. Now, Lyndon Johnson famously was president when Medicare passed in 1965. And the normal story that Johnson himself tells in his autobiography goes like this. Se uh, Representative Wilbur Mills was fighting, was resisting Medicare. He, 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 he stopped it single-handedly, and as chair of the Ways and Means Committee, he could do that. Then after the 1964 election, which was a landslide for the Democrats, Wilbur Mills is sitting there the last day of the markup of the bill. There are three bills before the committee, the, the administration proposal, which just covered hospital care, the AMA proposal, which just covered doctor's care, your hospital care wasn't gonna be covered, and another proposal uh, which suggested, let's not cover all people over 65, let's just cover poor people. Wilbur Mills, the great antagonist of, of, of Medicare, sits back and says, you know what, let's pass all three. The Johnson administration officials who were in the room at the time, they panic, what is Wilbur Mills up to? They go running to, by the way, Wilbur Mills says, could you rewrite the bill? and have it on my desk by nine o'clock tomorrow morning. They asked for an extension. Could we have till 5 p.m.? No, nine o'clock tomorrow morning. They go running to uh, Lyndon Johnson and they expect Johnson to say, oh, I don't know what Wilbur Mills is up. Instead he says, I think I'll go call my brother. He ain't, I'll, I'll go call my brother. What, what are you talking about, Mr. President? Now this is a story that is in Johnson's autobiography, The Vantage Point. Johnson says, you don't know that story. Every Texan knows that story. Turns out, as a young boy who wants to be a train, uh, who wants to be a switchman for the railroad, and they give him the test. They tell him, here's a switch, train going north 30 miles an hour, train going south 30 miles an hour. Here's the switch. What do you do, son? And the boy looks up and he says, I think I'll go call my brother. And they say, well, that's not the right answer. Why are you gonna call your brother? Well, he ain't never seen no train wreck before. Give Wilbur the money. Go ahead. We'll find it in the budget somewhere. And so Johnson then says, Wilbur Mills went from the goat to the hero for the old folks. He did something no one expected. That's the usual story of Medicare. Johnson delighted at the sidelines. Then we go to the tapes. What do the tapes say? As soon as Johnson takes over, he calls Wilbur right away. And we've got this on tape. He goes, Wilbur, I need Medicare. I need it bad. Wilbur, you got to pass Medicare for me. Wilbur Mills says, Mr. President, I've been fighting Medicare all my life. I can't just turn around. And Johnson says, Wilbur, make it bigger. Say it wasn't good enough for you. Wilbur, you'll get all the credit. Wilbur, this could make you vice president. Now, this is a five or six different tapes that we've heard. Uh, what I've just, the quotes I've just given you, so they're dot, dot, dots between them. But Johnson is relentless. He's the one who suggests put these different programs together. And Wilbur at first resists, and then he thinks about it, and then he tries to backstab Johnson. But at the end of the day, they make a deal. At one point, Wilbur Mills is walking onto the floor of Congress. This is never done. Johnson is on the phone to one of his liaisons for Congress, and he hears Wilbur's voice. And he says, who's that? That Wilbur? Put Wilbur on. And 
complete breach of protocol. They put, put Wilbur on the phone and Johnson goes, how's that Mills bill? I hope you're down there trying to get that Mills bill through. That's what he was calling Medicare. What's remarkable is this bill passes in March of 1965 and not till 2008 do we discover that Lyndon Johnson was in on the secret. He managed to give all the credit to Wilbur Mills. And though Wilbur sometimes said, he sometimes admitted to interviews, to interviewers, without Lyndon this would have never passed. Nevertheless, Johnson was in on it from the very start. And here's the lesson. He gave Mills all the credit. He didn't need the credit. He helped negotiate this extraordinary bill. Medicare is now three times the size it would have been. We now call Medicare Part A, the original bill, Medicare Part B, what physician services are under, and Medicaid, that was the third part. We've got all of those because Lyndon Johnson made this deal with Wilbur Mills and then gave Wilbur Mills all the credit. So we really rewrite in this book, rewrite the story of, uh, rewrite the story of Medicare. We try to put a lot of this in the book, how the politics feels, how you get it done. At the end of the book, we draw a series of lessons. So we take each president and we talk about the politics of them getting health care. And then at the end, we have a final chapter and we say, here are the lessons across all the presidencies, again, from Roosevelt to uh, George W. Bush. And a series of lessons. Lesson number one. Lesson number one is move fast. The concluding snippet of this lesson goes like this. The day after the election, the savvy health advisor turns to our president-elect and says, Mr. or Madam President-elect, hurry up, we're almost out of time. When you win an election, for a very brief moment, you have this enormous amount of capital. That capital, you lose that capital every single day. And most presidents come into office and they forget that. They think, well, the people have chosen, the people have selected me. That means they've selected my agenda. And that's true. For about six months, that agenda will dominate Washington. After this month seven, that's about July of your first year, what's everybody talking about? The midterm elections. Everybody's running for the midterm. And every, all that capital you gained, it's gone. Some presidents get this. Johnson got it. George W. Bush got it. He was very, very shrewd about cramming things through. And we believe Barack Obama got it, uh, partially because he had read the research. We actually have reason to believe he, he, or at least his advisors, read this book. And they got, move quickly. So imagine there was some feeling in the administration to put health care off uh, until things had settled down a little bit. The point man for health care, Tom Daschle, had a tax problem. He was so, uh, suddenly no longer part of the administration team. And a lot of people said, look, it's February of your first year. Let's put this off. Some of the people in the room knew, put it off and it never passes. Now imagine if they had put it off to the point where Bill Clinton actually put health care uh, on, the, on the congressional hopper. That would be the first month of the second year, January of 2010. What happens in January 2010? Scott Brown wins the special election. Healthcare would never have passed. Lesson number one, move fast. There's lots of other lessons. One of our favorites is learn to lose. See, often you lose a case, but do you, what do you do with your loss? Example, Harry Truman loses healthcare. He fights like mad, but he gets nowhere. He was terrible at working with Congress. He had no idea how to do it, but he kept fighting. So he kept speechifying. He kept saying that the Republicans, the do-nothing Republicans, have done a terrible thing to the American people. He wrote letters as an ex-president. So much so that when Lyndon Johnson passes Medicare, a shortened version of the health insurance, national health insurance that Truman wanted, just for people over 65, he said, we wouldn't be here today if not for Harry Truman. We're going to fly out to Independence, Missouri and sign this bill in front of Harry. His staff, Johnson's staff, thinks, wait a minute, Harry Truman, everybody's going to think socialized medicine because that's what the Republicans call the Truman bill. And so his staff says, no, no, that's socialized medicine. You don't want to do that. Johnson says, we're doing it. And so they fly out to Independence and Medicare is signed in front of an 82-year-old Harry Truman who then says, if you're a liberal, this is the highest moment 
of the second half of the 20th century. Lyndon Johnson, the great liberal icon, at least at the moment, until he gets mixed up in Vietnam, turns to Truman and he goes, Mr. President, only you can know how I feel as I sign this bill. And Harry, his voice breaking up, says, this is the happiest moment of my life. Um, Lyndon hands Harry so, a Medicare card number one. Bess Truman, by the way, is standing behind Harry. She's beaming, but you wonder what she thought to hear this is the happiest moment of his life, not some other moment. Be, be that as it may, these two men bond. Now, Johnson's point, and he makes it very explicit as he's signing the bill, is that Harry's fight, even though he lost, he fought and he fought and he fought, that fight made it possible for Medicare to pass because it got the public used to the idea. So one of our lessons is learn how to lose. Now, when we wrote that, it never occurred to us that another lesson might have been learn how to win. The Obama administration passes health reform, but they forgot the Truman lesson. They let it go. They let the enemies of the, of the, of the legislature define the legislature, define the bill. And so it became a rather unpopular bill. We know from public opinion polls that almost every piece of the bill is wild, very popular, but people don't know every piece of the bill. So you ask them, do you want to stop pre-existing condition clauses in health insurance? Uh, oh, yeah, 60, 70, 80 percent. Do you like Obamacare? Oh, no. Uh, again, uh, piece after piece. And our argument, and we can see this from president to president, is Healthcare is so complicated, you have to explain it in simple terms that the public understands. Presidents who fail to do that get punished. The huge anomaly of the Obama uh, administration is that they got it through Congress, they won the legislation, but they failed to explain it in terms people understand. Now, they ended up getting away with it, as it turns out, but it, at a very high cost to the legislation itself. We're still battling about it and about its implementation. Learn how to lose, and really that lesson is explain it to the public because it's too complicated for them to understand all the details. Explain it in terms they understand. And ironically, the Obama administration failed to do that. Truman did it magnificently. You know who else did a good job? George W. Bush. He had a Medicare expansion. It was the largest Medicare expansion in history. Arguably the most conservative president in the second half of the uh, uh, 20th century, Ronald Reagan and George Bush, uh, both of them passed huge Medicare expansions. And both of them were really good at explaining it in nice, simple terms. Reagan passed catastrophic Medicare expansion, and he goes out there and says, look, we got to worry about people who are going broke. Now, the Republicans hated it, and a year later, Congress repeals it. But Reagan himself got it through and explained it in nice, simple terms. And for a while, it was quite popular. The legislation was so convoluted, it ended up collapsing. And again, Bush, he got out there and he simply explained, look, prescription drugs are too expensive. We're going to expand the pool. The details of the bill were hellishly complicated, but Bush didn't go into the details. Liberals like to criticize Bush for being simplistic, but in this case, a nice, simple explanation was very useful. Today, Republicans hate this expansion. The Democrats who fought against it actually like the expansion. But that's the sign of a very successful operator, someone who can manage to get Republicans and Democrats, enough Democrats with Republicans, to pass it and explain it to the public in nice, simple terms. So no Democrat wants to repeal this thing, and it's never going to be repealed, I would predict. There was a successful president. He moved quickly, he explained it in nice, simple terms, and he worked well with both sides of the aisle. Three lessons for getting things through Congress. Let me tell you one other thing that's important. Passion. This may seem obvious, but presidents can go at health care, sort of holding their nose and try to pass it, or with gusto. The gusto people, Truman, uh, Kennedy, Johnson, Obama, uh, W. Bush, those presidents were successful because they came at it and they gave everything to it. There are other presidents, Jimmy Carter, George Bush I, George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, Eisenhower. These are presidents who, while they pursued health care, they didn't understand it. They didn't really like it. They kind of pushed it half-heartedly. They got slaughtered every time. This is too complicated and too big 
to do half-heartedly. So a lesson for national health care, really it's a lesson for any major achievement, either go big or go home. Because if you go small, if you are not passionate, you're going to fail and you're going to fall flat on your face. One thing that we really didn't expect to find was that Republicans have, by and large, been more successful at health care reform than Democrats. That it's, a, in a sense, it's the Nixon going to China. So that when Republicans take office, everybody assumes we're going to go into a period of health care drought. But think about it. Richard Nixon comes in in uh, 1968. He has, he has been a very conservative uh, politician for much of his life. He made his name in the Red Scares uh, as a kind of minor league Senator McCarthy. And yet, right away, he begins to think about how we can redo national health insurance. And he comes up with very creative thinking about national health insurance. He's the first one really to say, look, people with private insurance, they're not going to want to give up their private insurance. Let's keep that and let's make national health insurance around private health insurance. He's the first one to say, you know what? Competition might be really useful. Let's see if we can work in HMOs and what we now call managed care organizations. So he put together a quite complicated but very sophisticated health insurance package. Trivia question, who's the first president to get national health insurance through a committee in Congress, the Ways and Means Committee as it happens? Answer, Richard Nixon. He gets it through by one vote, many of the Republicans voting against it, but he gets it through. All future national health insurance proposals are sons or grandsons, or daughters or granddaughters of Richard Nixon's proposal. Now he doesn't win, he gets bounced out of office before he can get national health insurance through. But we had an amazing alliance between Democratic congressmen and the Nixon administration trying to get national health insurance through. Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan comes to power. Ronald Reagan was the great antagonist of Medicare. He has a famous recording. You can find it on YouTube, a wonderful recording, fighting against Medicare. We will, t if this program passes, we will tell our children and our children's children what it was like in America when men were free. This, and he's one of the people who called it socialism. Ronald Reagan gets into office, you read his diary. We gotta pass catastrophic care for the old people, and I hope I can do something for the working stiff too. What? Ronald Reagan, when we were sitting in the archive reading his diary thinking, what is going on? And sure enough, Republicans in his administration hate the idea of expanding Medicare to cover catastrophic costs. In fact, in the cabinet meeting, one cabinet officer votes for him. All the rest try to talk him out of it. Reagan, no, we're going for this. And Reagan signs the bill. Now it collapses. As soon as Bush takes over, he says, we're going we're gonna to cut this. It was a very unpopular piece of legislation because it was half Democratic, half Republican. But notice, it was Ronald Reagan who had the largest expansion of Medicare um, up, uh, up to that point in history. And who's the next largest? It's George W. Bush, this guy that liberals love to hate. His staff all tells the same story. He decided he wanted an expansion of Medicare to cover drugs. He had crackerjack meetings. Apparently, if you were 10 seconds late to a meeting when Bush called it, if it was called for 1 o'clock and you came in 10 seconds after 1 o'clock, there are very graphic descriptions of what he did to people, uh, and it was not nice. Um, he, and he just, he had read the memos. He was incredibly well organized. He knew what he wanted. The, the George Bush that emerges from these interviews that we did completely surprised us. And to a person, including staff, Democratic staff in Congress, they said, this guy really was focused. He knew what he wanted, and he got it. So here are three examples, Nixon, Reagan, and Bush, three very conservative presidents, at least by the standards of the day, each one of them, who did these massive expanses, expansions of Medicare or national health insurance. So the lesson, Republicans have been surprisingly successful at getting health care. Obama broke that string. First successful Democrat at getting a big major health care program through since 1965. There's one other story that's very important. When Harry Truman proposes national health insurance, the leader in the Senate, 
the, uh, the, the Senate minority leader, the Republican leader in the Senate, Bob Taft. Uh, Bob Taft was not a very warm and cuddly individual, but he gets up and he calls this the most social, socialistic uh, bill ever before this body. And he actually walks out of the hearings after a bitter battle. The rhetorical message has been cast in stone. Every suggestion by a Democrat for expanding health care is socialism. People will remember how bitter the fight got in the Obamacare debate. What's remarkable, and we tell this story clearly in the book, every single time, it is socialism, it is the end of America as we know it, it is a huge rhetorical battle, and it's always one-sided. The Republicans, the opponents will say, this is socialism, this is bureaucracy run amok, this is death panels. Death panels stand in a very long legacy. The Democratic response, no, 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 it's not. No, no, this isn't socialism. No, no, let us tell you the details of the bill. On the one hand, a clear ideological message. On the other hand, panic. And the inability to craft an alternative, a set of simple symbols about what is going on. This has been a theme. It's recurred every single time. One of the questions we ask ourselves in the book as we go through these presidencies is why? Why does national health insurance, much more than other pieces of legislation, much more than other issues, why does it create such fervent debate and argument and anger? And as far as we can tell, I think for reasons that we explain, complicated reasons, healthcare has, beco has become a symbol of the way Americans are. For Democrats, it is a symbol of whether or not we as a society afford each other basic decency. So it's a, it goes to the very heart of what it means to be a liberal Democrat. For Republicans, health care is an example of something that ought to be a private market good that Democrats are trying to take into the public sector. So it goes into the heart of what a capitalist economy should be. That's the heart of the Republican message. Since 1935, both Democrats and Republicans have used health care to answer the question, who are we as Americans? So this is not about a program. It's not about taxes. It's not about benefits. It's about the definition of what Americans are as each party sees it. So the two definitions of what it means to be a Republican and what it means to be a Democrat seems to come into play with these with these proposals. Ironically, that's why Republicans have been more successful at it. They can actually assuage some of their own party to come along with their program. However, when Republicans do that, the party base ends up never forgiving them. People love Ronald Reagan, but they didn't like his Medicare expansion. <laughs> the party base has never forgiven uh, George Bush for passing this Medicare expansion. So those successes end up costing them in the long run because they violate the fundamental principle of what it is to be a Republican. And likewise, for Democrats, this goes to the heart of what it is to be a Democrat. That's why our battles are so great. And that's the story we tell, the story beneath the story. We go into the archives, we look at these people as men, but we also look at these debates and what they mean for their parties and for America itself. There are lots and lots of books on health care. Some of them are dull books about healthcare policy. I've written some of them myself, and they, they are, they are let's, let's call them technical books. Uh, there are other books that look at the congressional process or some piece of it. Um, as far as I know, there is no book that goes from president to president and looks at the presidency as a whole, that looks at how these men as human beings grappled with healthcare, got it through Congress, went to the public, the whole package. So this is the only book, as far as I know, and I, I think I've, I think I know, uh, this is the only book that looks at the presidency as an institution, as a set of human beings, and how they grappled with what ends up being one of the great challenges for every president. One thing that's interesting is there are very few kinds of, of legislation that take up every single presidency. I mean, what does Roosevelt and Eisenhower and Truman and Kennedy and Nixon, what do they all have in common? Well, they all dealt with the economy. They all had to deal with foreign policy. And they all had to deal with health care. 
So this offers a window into the presidency itself and into the way we've developed our healthcare system. It's this combination, and I think that is quite unique about this book. When people read our book, I think the first thing that I'd like them to come away with is to see these presidents, every one of them, as human beings. You know, we make such icons out of them. Political scientists are the worst at this, but they're all, they're, they're statues, they're larger than life, they're, but these are men, someday men and women, but these are, these are human beings with all the frailties that human beings have. And the first thing, the thing that really strikes you as you read in the archives, and this is a complicated policy area, right? But what you see their humanity, and you see both their strengths and their weaknesses. Some things are just crazy. The uh, Prime Minister of, Eng of England calls at one point during a crisis, and Richard Nixon is too drunk to take the call. And the White House is trying to figure out how do we put the prime minister on because the president is drunk. Now, I say this about Richard Nixon. He was a brilliant man. He was maybe, pound for a pound of gray matter, the smartest man we see. He sits in the, in the, across the street from the Oval Office, the fireplace going, the air conditioner turned up full crank because it's summer, and he writes in yellow pads. He just writes thoughts. Some of it is maudling, I have to be strong. Some, is about, some of it is brilliant stuff. You read this and you see the future of healthcare predicted piece by piece. I mean, we all, all healthcare is in the shadow of Richard Nixon. You, these are in the archives, these yellow notes. And you think this was a genius, a political genius. At the same time, this is a man who could be so drunk, out of it drunk, at night in the White House, this tortured, uh, hurt man that the whole White House staff, finally has Henry Kissinger has to s explain to the people in, um, in England that the president is ill and he's in bed and he'll have to call you back tomorrow morning so that you get a sense of the full package, not just this fairly dull national health insurance bill that he was really had a hand in. You see the extent to which he understood health care and also the extent to which he had to negotiate his own personal demons as he passed it. Take another example, Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter's problem was he knew he was smarter than everybody in the room, and he tried to get into such detail. So at one point, a memo goes around, and Jimmy Carter would take notes with his fountain pen. You can see his handwriting. And at one, one point in one healthcare memo, he says, and don't forget about PSROs. PSROs. This is a very obscure, it, it means a peer, uh, it's a physician review organization that, uh, in which physicians get together and review what other physicians do. PSROs, later PROs. Look, if you're the president of the United States, you've got no business down this deep in the weeds. Jimmy Carter got way into the weeds, so he's actually writing, we need these minor, minor interventions by physicians. And that was his problem. He got so into the weeds that he forgot that the president's job is to tell the big picture. Now, it's easy to say, you know, Jimmy Carter's real problem was he was not very good at articulating the big picture. What you don't see until you get into the archives, and I, 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 I think when people read our book, they'll get a sense of this. The president as an individual, his own personality was really driving this uh, this, this kind of detailed look. So that's, a, that's an aspect of the, of the presidency and of healthcare. We usually don't think about that the guy, the individual, really drives things forward.